Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I know you gave a wonderful introduction to the many, many things Nova Scribes is doing. And I'm going to do that. And I'm going to add Brian next to me. Really quickly, I, I can't, I didn't grasp the exact words, how you described who is welcome to Nova Scribes. Mm -hmm. Would you say that again? You had such I a would great... Love to. So Nova Scribes, like I said, it's a free and open forum for visual practitioners. And the way that I define that is anybody who uses visuals to move others. So you could include graphic recorders, scribes, sketch noters, and consultants, trainers, and facilitators who all use visuals. Use visuals to move people. Fantastic. Love it. Because I was kind of curious tonight, having attended a few sessions and been happily in this position twice before, um, curious about sort of how specific the work is of what people do here. So I'm going to ask people for, to raise their hands in a moment. Thank you, Brian. So this is, I did a classic speaker thing and anyone who has drawn a special, anyone who's organized or drawn um, annual conferences with lots of speakers or can't conferences with lots of speakers, I did a classic thing of changing the name <laughs> of the talk. Uh, and I'll explain that in a moment, but we're still very much talking about visual listening. Uh, so let me quickly, I'd love to just tell you where my eyes are going over here. I'm in Chicago at the very, very, very Northern edge. Lake Michigan is one block that way. Um, and I'm in front of many screens, which helps me teach folks anywhere in the world. Happily, I can see your faces up here in gallery view. And if I'm looking this direction, I'm seeing the chat of the meeting. Never be shy about asking a question or making a comment in the chat. I love this flow of being present, even if we're miles and miles and kilometers apart, to be able to see your questions, see your comments as we go. Uh, if I'm looking this way, I'm looking at Zoom or my slides. One thing a little tricky about my setup is uh, please do not direct message me during the meeting because that's going to get buried down there. So feel free to uh, add anything you want to the chat. If it's something you want to say one on one, follow up with me later. How does that sound? Sound good? Excellent. Fantastic. And um, was there some? Oh, quickly. Uh, again, I'll add this link to the chat. That is not it. Um, there is a PDF for tonight. So I wanted to encourage folks to open that up. It will be, you'll get a whole heck of a lot more if you can open this and print it. If you can't, go ahead and uh, it's useful to have it open in a tab if you're at a computer and can have a couple windows going at once. Uh, you will already see I'm, I'm, I'm priming you to join me for even more of this if you want even more of this, because uh, I'll explain that in a second. So those are more resources, and then we can definitely talk about what March 12th means, and it'll make a heck of a lot of sense <laughs> once, once you see what's what. All right, now let me do that. Here we are, visual listening. <laughs> when Brian reached out and said, would you like to come back? I said, of course I would. And he said, what would you like to talk about? And I said, visual listening. And he said, great. <laughs> easy yes for me, easy yes for him. And we are absolutely talking about visual listening. And we'll talk about a little bit uh, sort of levels of detail under this beautiful skill set. The first thing I did want to ask is um, I talk about people either doing rabbit work meaning it's live and you have to make your decisions super fast or turtle work where it's what a lot of us would consider more like studio work where you have more time to process and iterate. So I'd love a show of hands. How many people are doing rabbit work where you're doing real time support? Excellent. How many people are doing turtle work? How many are doing both? Excellent. Fantastic. Brian's got lots of turtles, turtle, turtle, turtle. Uh, no, rabbits, not turtles all the way up and down, your rabbits all the way up and down. Excellent. So this is what the pages of that PDF looks like. I'll just add that link one more time. Um, this is, like I said, if you can print it out, it'll be super useful. If you can't, just grab some blank pieces of paper. But uh, these are what's going to help you make the most of this session. Uh, so the first thing, as soon as uh, Brian and I were talking about tonight and what this could be, uh, 
Brian mentioned this wheel. So this wheel was from the IFEP conference in 2013. I had the great pleasure of uh, being asked to be the opening keynote speaker. It's funny, it's just under 11 years since this conference. And one of the challenges folks were seeing at that time was, um, well, for some folks, kind of two, two general experiences. The folks who felt like they were doing this work that we do, this I love that broad definition of moving people with visuals. Um, they either were in a place in the world or working with industries who had no idea what they were talking about. How many folks feel like you're in that space where you just feel like you're explaining it over and over again? A couple of hands, yeah. Um, or they felt like everyone and their brother's doing this work. <laughs> it's like how I can't get away from other people doing this work. Anyone feel like they're in a crowded market? Really? Oh, great, great. I think there's nothing but opportunity, which is why for this particular keynote, uh, th this wheel is a wheel of different competencies we have in it, as visual practitioners. And uh, tonight, Brian, do you want to say anything about how you use this wheel? Yeah, this is really cool. So for the the few of you that have worked with me and know about the best athlete chart, um, this particular tool was the, I would, I would say it was the first instantiation of it. Um, and so I, I find this to be a, let me just go ahead and turn it on for me. So this, uh, oh, yeah. there we go. So um, this is a really, really powerful tool in terms of just gauging your own skill set, identifying areas for development, areas for opportunity. And, and I use it um, for actually placing associates on jobs. And so, for example, if I've got somebody who's a really, really strong illustrator and somebody who's not so much, but wants to learn illustration, I'll pair the two of them together so that the one who wants to develop their skill set can work with that, that better athlete. Um, so this has been a foundation of my practice since, well, since you rolled it out, Brandy, and I'm really grateful for it. Awesome. Yeah, for sure. And currently, the most of the keynote is online. If folks are interested, message me. Uh, if there's enough people interested, I'll make sure I get the I get I can uh, figure out how to get access because the, the, the talk does exist in whole. Uh, and yeah, so what we'll do tonight is look at a smaller slice of that beautiful wheel. Uh, so back there, uh, -huh. uh, this, oh, and anytime, um, we're talking about specific pages in the PDF, you're going to see that little tab in the lower left-hand corner. I'm not great at giving you the very details of now we're on page X. So I let that corner of the slides do it for me. So. This is an example 11 years ago of my self-assessment on this wheel. Uh, and you can see there's a couple areas where I, I would rate myself um, having less experience and have those arrows. There were areas I wanted to grow into. And in this wheel, so importantly, that bottom quarter of the, of the wheel is open because we all bring different skills to this work, it's different ways that we differentiate ourselves, uh, different ways we know there's certain industries, clients, processes that we bring, the people we love to work with best. So there's lots of good space to add your specific stuff. Now today, really we're focusing in on the listening side. And at that time, 11 years ago, I had split the um, listening skills of visual, practi visual practice, scribing. I call myself a graphic facilitator. That's what they called it when I fell into this work, October, 1996. That could be a whole other discussion about what we call ourselves and what that means. But in this case, the listening skills of this live uh, live visual support of groups moving people for moving people forward with visuals. I don't think that's quite right, Brian, but that's okay. I got close. Uh, <laughs> the three we have here are two different types of focus as we're capturing content. Participant focus, that is that every individual who speaks up in that meeting feels heard. They recognize their point, their words in what you've captured. Uh, the process focus is when we are looking kind of at the higher level, a um, little bit of an aerial view where so many times when we're supporting people with visuals, they may be experiencing a new kind of process or they might be one point in a very large long-term process. So that's when we have a chance to not just get what is said in the room, but also be capturing what the process looks like. I love it when I have that kind of project. I'm a process nerd. 
<laughs> through and through. Uh, and uh, what's great is being able to also uh, get some of that part of their experience captured so that when they look back at these images, they have the, it's sort of reminding them and retraining them and helping them keep keep helping them understand where they at are at in their process. Did that sentence make any sense? It came out kind of awkward. Okay, great. Got a couple nods. Thank you. <laughs> so um, so that's what I had for listening back in 20, uh, 2013. And uh, one thing might sound a little strange. I'm going to give you this this warning up front. For this session, I do not want you to treat yourself like a recording device. What do I mean? This is when we are, because we are so fantastic when we are supporting groups at being, you know, heads down or back to the group, looking at our piece of paper, uh, doing lots and lots of good listening and thinking and processing and getting their conversation onto that new surface. And that is a very different way of showing up than being here right now for yourself as a learner. Make sense? So when we go into that channel of capture, often we're, we're playing this role. <laughs> we're treating ourselves like a recording device. So tonight, you, this is recorded. We will get it up. You can always come back and listen again. I would much rather see your faces than the tops of your heads tonight <laughs> because I want you to be able to really be listening to everything we're going to share together in the session, be listening and being present for yourself. Does that make sense? Especially because the first time you hear the models I'm gonna share, the details, this experience, the very first time you experience this, that is when we get that super incredibly important um, information of our gut reactions. So tonight there might be different parts of this session where you're like, oh, I feel more than comfortable with this part of listening. For me, this part of listening is like slipping into a warm bath, right? When that wonderful feeling. Other parts you might go, oh, <laughs> that's really challenging. That's something I'm not very comfortable with. And then you decide, do I wanna get uh, more comfortable with it or would I like, like, like to focus on other things? So please show up for yourself. As I said, when Brian asked what the topic could be, I said visual listening, and it's not inaccurate, but I did want to make it clear, visual listening is also the name of a specific deep dive course. It was a one-day workshop I led with folks in my membership. We nerded out big time. You're going to get to see a glimpse of this workshop tonight, um, but because it's a specific name, I wanted to make it clear, uh, and a couple other resources, my core course, the Agribeck method, you might hear me mention that, that's called AgMe. The second and third modules focus on listening. Uh, another deep dive day called Lucid Listening uh, is a whole nother full day archive. Uh, those are for any kind of visual thinker. And then you will also see references to Gold Star Graphic Facilitation, a comprehensive course for graphics facilitators specifically. None of this is meant as a sales pitch, it's a context setter. And yes, of course, if you do wanna learn more, there are these resources for you. So we got a new name. How to be a legendary listener. So sound good? Would anyone like that? No, yes, no, maybe so. Get a little claps, thank you. Seeing some nods, seeing some jazz hands. Thank you for your enthusiasm, I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, I guess I had that slide twice. I had a couple, oh, that's why. Now we're gonna go to um, here, give myself those little repeats to switch modes. All right, oh, but you don't need two of me. Let's do that, there we go, all right. So I think I'm preaching to the choir, this American phrase, you know, but you already are exactly where I'm at, but I want to remind all of us I believe there's nothing more valuable than listening skills. And that is um, absolutely true. I think, truly, I think anyone with strong listening skills and strong facilitation skills is always going to rise above, not in a judgmental way, just in a being super useful <laughs> and super good at what you do way. Uh, if you can bring strong listening skills, strong facilitation skills to any role, any role, you are going to stand apart 
and be the best person on the team. Uh, and uh, what I love about strong listening skills is the very, very, very basic thing that when you are listening to someone one-on-one, -on -one, the first thing, the most important thing is that person feels that sense of validation. They have that sense of feeling heard. Whenever we're in positions where we might be feel nervous about standing up in front of a group using visual tools, uh, I always want to say to folks, like, everyone in that room, every participant, they're on your side because you're listening to them. <laughs> you're a human validation machine. They love you. And if there's one person in the room who's, like, correcting your spelling, everyone else thinks that guy's a jerk or that gal's a jerk or that they is a jerk. So <laughs> know that... Most basically, you know, we are we are professional validation machines and how much that creates that sense of one-on-one -on -one connection. And we all know, excellent case, I'm just seeing you're kind of giving us, us some great uh, uh, snippets. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, the spelling co corrector feels good about themselves. You know, and if they need that, bless their hearts. <laughs> You soon learn that that kind of comment is absolutely about them and not about the work you're doing at all. Um, Rachel or Brian, do you mind just muting anyone who, I just got a couple stray sounds in the background. So we already know the power individually. And of course, we know that when a group of people are working together and listening to each other, uh, are truly listening to each other, there's always that stronger collaboration, that higher engagement, the fact that when folks are listening to each other, how much more progress they can make, how, the, how much more easily they can make the decisions and solve the problems they are there to do. And we all know the world has never been noisier. I, I don't think I have to convince anyone here, the constant flow of content, the fact that everything feels like it's turned up to 11, Sadly, because we're in the attention economy, we went from the experience economy to the attention economy. If we're into a new economy, I haven't tracked it yet, but really our eyeballs, our attention being the, the currency, uh, you know, things are meant to be the clickbait and grab you and all that stuff. And there is the obligatory mention of artificial intelligence. And now we're going to be done. We're going to not talk about it again. Now we have machines that let us pump out more and more and more content. Now, this noisy world, that only makes us more valuable as partners, as teammates, as family members, all this good stuff. So um, <clears throat> the challenge is, and I, I, when I was just saying listening, you know, I'm thinking about listening in the most traditional sense, that very broad definition of, you know, what we think about as listening with the ears and the body and the eyes and the, the receptivity, the presence with somebody else nothing more valuable. And traditionally, listening is intangible. It's ephemeral. We know what it feels like when we've been, when somebody is truly listening to us. Now, what we all know here, <laughs> again, preaching to the choir, what we all know here is that when we very, very simply just add paper and pen, we absolutely change our ability to listen. And that is the kind of, just using these very simple materials is what helps lead us to that legend status. So with these physical tools, we, we use both these external physical tools in the room, all sorts of different ways we can use whiteboards, sticky notes, giant sheets of paper, tiny pieces of paper, all these things. We're using those physical tools in harmony with our internal skills, our smarts, our empathy, our creativity, our critical thinking. And we make what we hear, what, take what is intangible and make it visible, spatial, and tangible. So the first thing is um, that with visible, when you make what you hear visible, there's absolutely no doubt somebody feels heard. They can see their words and they can also see how their words connect to other people's words, other people's perspectives. We're making what we hear spatial. This is, and I love this, in um, uh, as the antidote to the noisy world is when we're able to actually organize people's thoughts and perspectives. This is where we say, okay, these things are similar. We're going to put them together. These things are dissimilar. We're going to pull them apart. 
all the spatial relations and what, what we're hearing. And then third, again, tangible. Now this is, I love the how much the tangibility shifts the experience in the room. The first thing is there is no doubt the group's feeling of productivity. You're literally surrounded by your work. One of the things I love about multi-day projects is thinking about what work is surrounding this team right now? What needs to stay here for them to go into the next phase of their work? What should go away? So really being cognizant, aware of physical artifacts of the work they've done. Another thing is it becomes that, uh, that anchor for memory. You know, how, I'm sure all of us have had our own experience or seen somebody we've worked with do this where they go, oh, I think that idea was over there, right? There's that physical sense of like, that idea lives over there. Um, so it's a great way to retrieve information, but also having that external feeling of this idea living on, be made tangible, having a place to be in the room is fantastic for tension and conflict. So if there is something you disagree with or someone you disagree with, you don't have to point at them. You can point to the idea. And how many folks have felt that kind of shift? How, a couple folks, yeah, yeah, incredible. And all of this in our world can be, you know, it can be as simple as writing words on new surfaces. And you know, we're not even talking about anything that has to have more visual choices like color or line or scale or any of those things. All right. So we know that, um, we know how this works. Again, <laughs> this is what we eat, sleep, and breathe in this particular group. And aware of the fact that some folks might watch this video later and feel like, oh, this is, feels very strange. Uh, welcome. <laughs> welcome to a wonderful way of working. Uh, I want to, uh, just last Thursday, I was um, in a session uh, that was led by my friend and my colleague, uh, Jenny. Anyone who joined me at Envision last fall met Jenny. Anyone who saw, uh, participated in Hello Inner Critic last month or watched that video, uh, you'll soon see Jenny again. And I mentioned visual listening. She asked, you know, what do people have coming up in the week? I mentioned visual listening and instantly those two words piqued her interest, much like they might have piqued yours and is why those who are with me live are here with me live right now. And it spurred a story. She had the story immediately come to mind. It was so great. I asked her to, uh, to tell that story. So we're now gonna watch about a seven minute video, uh, Jenny and I talking and her telling the story uh, from uh, her past experience. Do you have that close by, Brian, or should I grab it? I got it. Give me just a second to queue it up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you see my screen okay? Yep. Here we go. A really interesting story. I was talking about how I'm preparing for this visual listening workshop. And, you know, you were asking, like, what does that mean? What visual listening? And, you know, so often we have this experience of note taking and note taking in school. And that is a way that we're making our learning concrete, making it tangible, you know, so we can use those notes to study, you know, stay present and focused, retain the information. Can you share what you just shared in our earlier yeah. conversation about this very unique experience? I never Absolutely. thought about When you were explaining what that was, it instantly took me back to 1998. So in, in my undergrad years, I was studying deaf history and deaf in deaf education. And so the study abroad for that, it's not going abroad, it's going to DC and you go to Gallaudet University. Gallaudet University is the premier university in the world for the deaf and hard of hearing. Um, and my sign language skills were pathetic. Uh, and, and so I was going because I really wanted to be fluent. I wanted to have really good language skills. But uh, because I was in undergrad down in Florida, and I was studying education back then, I wasn't allowed to take education classes. They wouldn't transfer because of the state. So I could only take my history classes at Gallaudet. I was like, that's cool. I'll take history classes. So I took American history, world history, uh, history of deaf people and Hitler's Europe, the whole thing. And so I was like, okay, this will be really cool. I love history. It'll be fun. And I got to my first class and I had to work really hard to understand everything was in a American Sign Language with voice off, no audio. And so I was trying to learn how to pay super close attention to that. And at the end of my first class, I kind of looked down at my notebook and realized I didn't take any notes because you can't write down and turn your head down when there's no auditory and everything is being expressed in American Sign Language. So, oh, and 
for me, I had to doubly think about it. Yeah. Um, because I was still learning the language and that sometimes a professor would have a sign that I would not know and they would use it again and again. Like I remember one sign was this. I was like, what does that even mean? He's like, divide. I'm like, oh, okay, now can you do yeah. it all over again? So I know what the heck yeah. you were talking about. <laughs> right. So for me, um, it took some learning and I recognized that most of my peers who were deaf themselves, yeah. I, you know, I was, I was the outlier there. They didn't open up notebooks. They didn't even bring pens often to the class. They just yeah. sat back and paid attention because we were watching in, in sign language, it's like receptive listening because you listen oh. into your eyeballs, not into your ears. Ah. And so we would like, we'd be watching what would happen. And so I had to change my brain and learn how to not memorize because it's history. I still had to jot down a few notes and make sure I did the reading, but you totally. read differently, you prepared differently, you followed up differently. And then because it was a visual language, um, it was like the pictures were painted outside. Right into mm. my brain and i just had to remember that but yeah it was tricky i will i will admit the first probably month or so i really really struggled i had to read everything a couple of times i had to take notes after furiously trying to remember the dates and all the different things that you need for a history class so totally uh, definitely fascinating oh my gosh so yeah i know that um i mentioned that when folks are speaking at you know a visual thinkers conference or folks who sketch note or you know take these visual notes uh, as a speaker, you have to get used to the fact that you're going to see a whole lot of people's heads, the tops yeah. of their heads, because, you know, you're not getting the same kind of eye contact, whether it's in person or in the Zoom room, as you would, uh, because so many folks are focused that way. And I al always mention, um, you know, when I'm working sort of, you know, large and live scale as a graphic facilitator, you know, that's professional visual listening. And there are folks who they they kind of like, glue themselves to the wall and are facing the paper the whole time. And I'm like, wait a second, you know, there is so much information you're getting that's not verbal, you know, so yes. it is important to stop, especially in the ebbs and flows of conversations, um, to stop and like, look at the group and notice, you know, what is the reaction to this? What is people's body language? Like that's more of the information we're taking in that isn't just the auditory. Um, but I really appreciate that in your case, you know, I'm always thinking about, in any given moment where our attention can go and any time you're working with a non-native language more of your attention is being taken up with translating like i, I don't Absolutely. know that we give ourselves enough credit to understand that for your peers in the class who already were fluent maybe native asl they um they had so much more speed and ease so they needed far less of that of that kind of i always think of it like our our attention is like a beaker and there's like different things you can fill it up with right like just totally. the amount of volume of their attention that had to be taken with watching the professor speak sign was so much less than yours you know so that's just Absolutely. Like part of the equation right Absolutely. And it was, it was really challenging. There were so many changes that I just didn't anticipate when I got there. For example, just the way we sit, um, you don't sit in rows. We sit in a semicircle, right? So that if somebody has a question or says something, we can turn and see what they're saying. Periphery, right? Right. So like yeah. everything is in a semicircle, everything. It, it's so like just learning to that there is no such thing as hiding in the back row of a history <laughs> class everybody's in the front row baby right like so yeah. we're all in the front row we're all paying attention in a different kind of way oh my gosh well in in american sign language one of the things you learn very quickly and i don't know the exact percentage so anybody watching this who who is fluent and native in american sign language i apologize if i'm doing it wrong but like 80 90 percent of sign language is facial expression oh oh most of it is facial expression you yeah. know so if i sign the word who and i'm like who who Ooh, you know, like there's so many different meanings for yeah. the for one sign. So the hand shape and what my hand is doing is just a small bit and it's all very expressive. And so one of the things that I've learned to do when listening, as you said, visual listening, is I'm yeah. looking at the body language. I'm looking at that facial expression very specifically. Facial expressions um, are awesome. everything. Awesome. Thank you for that story. It's brilliant. Oh, you're love so it, welcome. Love I love that yeah. there's a there's a connection to that with one uh, with the amazing stuff that you do. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Jenny. You're welcome. Just wanted to give you a few moments to uh, just make any notes of what you uh, any observations about what you heard in that video. 
And certainly if you want to share anything that stood out to you, if you want to share that in the chat, I welcome it. Rachel said the shift required to just watch and learn. Yes. Most, most of the information in the face, semicircles for better listening. Perhaps deaf culture is more communal, sitting in circles. Yeah, interesting how hi hierarchy or structures may show up just simply in the way people are sitting in the room. And certainly what the relationship is between teacher and student. In my world, I don't call folks students, I call everybody learners. Because even that feels like we're all lifelong learners, that sense. Love the acting out the history lessons. Excellent. Fantastic. Uh, Brian, I appreciate, uh, can you say a little bit more about, can you share what you added to the chat about the analogy? Because that's oh, exactly where we're going next. Yeah, this is geeking out pretty darn hard. So I'm, I'm, I, I kind of love neuroscience and all that good stuff. Um, and so the, the, the analogy that um, Brandy used about the beaker is absolutely accurate from a neuroscience perspective. Um, you could think of the ascending reticular activator as what in psychological terms is called arousal. Now, don't get excited. It's not what you think it is. It's basically the level at which we are at our optimum level of peak performance. Um, not enough stimulus, we get bored. Too much stimulus, we get overstimulated and it's like it's too much and it's just stressful. Um, and so there are what are called narrow ARA people and wide ARA people. And depending on who you are, you may have different levels of, of attention and capacity um, and actually seeking out stimulus versus backing off of it. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, I think there's absolutely ways that we are wired, you know, so like you're saying, like your biology may have these maybe narrow or wide, depending on just how you as a human being are built. Yes. And, and you can also right? stretch. So the way that I like to think of it is, is that you have your default setting, but with time and practice, you can learn to throw that switch if you need to. Absolutely. You could not have set me up better for what's happening next. <laughs> So the uh, here you can see that beaker. And um, again, I love this metaphor of your, uh, think of the beaker again as what are you filling up your attention and focus with in any given moment? And you know this is an example of these different color stripes. We're not gonna go into a lot of detail in this particular metaphor today that lives other places, but just thinking about even much like that circle of competencies, thinking about where our attention can be in the moment when we're working with other glorious humans, when we're working visually, here's some of those layers that could be filling up our beaker. Our own internal state, our focus and our confidence, very simply if we're hungry <laughs> or tired, right? Uh, our environment and the content itself. Am I in a space where I can hear easily or am I familiar with the content or not? There's absolutely our control of materials. How comfortable do I feel with the materials I'm working with? Did my pen just run out of ink? The next is listening. And this is you know listening for what is it I wanna capture? What is most important here? Distilling is when you take those ideas, what you want to capture and how do you make it more succinct? We'll talk far more about these few layers here. Placement, where does this idea go in what I'm writing or drawing? There's that, that uh, setting up, showing connections between different ideas. Uh, uh, do certain ideas, similar ideas sit near each other? Is there a line that actually shows a connection between those two or those three or those however many? Uh, color, am I using color to actually color code and organize information? Or could I be using color as a way to create more depth and uh, a, a sense of depth of information on the page. Imagery, I'm not anti-imagery. I just know there's so many of these other great, def other great visual choices we have and spatial reasoning and abstract thinking that is my favorite stuff to learn, uh, but got, can't, can't leave icon iconography or imagery out of the equation at all. Size or scale, is this a really big idea within the drawing? Is it a small idea? Is it a supporting detail? Composition is when we are thinking about what is kind of the shape of this drawing as a whole. Can I understand how these different pieces fit together? 
and the sense of flow. I love to think of this both as your own flow state in the moment, but also is there a sense of movement or flow in your drawing itself? Does that sound like a pretty good, uh, a pretty robust list of things we're doing when we're doing this stuff? I think I might have just seen Nancy say, wow. <laughs> Excellent. Awesome. Now, this is a complex set of skills. Absolutely. And we are going to, even these skills are complex, what we're going to focus on here and now. And these skills are learnable. I think this absolutely ties in with what Brian was saying. I think it ties to our experiences. Not too long ago, I was having several conver I was having conversations with several several different people who teach, and I was so surprised that there's just this weird thing of like three conversations in a row where teachers were telling me or they were sharing, saying, you know, I was working with twenty people, and I know only two people are going to do the thing I'm teaching them. And it was, and they were all like, it was very much like the sense of I'm teaching people and there's some people are going to take to it and some people that aren't. There's some people who are kind of wired for this and some people that aren't. And to me, at least my philosophy of teaching and learning is much like those switches that we all have the capacity to learn skills. Now, whether it feels comfortable and we want to do it more <laughs> is another question, uh, but I'm definitely of the opinion that these are all learnable skills. And even if you don't go to the nth degree in this or whatever these friends and peers were teaching, there's still merit in that progress. Do I have any, any, anyone agreeing with me here on this, like the skill? Thank you. <laughs> so, and this complexity that we'll get to what makes learning the complex skill set easier. Now, I love this, the uh, more recent discovery. I believe there's two slow ways and two fast ways to learn. The first slow way is practice. Second one is experience. My distinction between these two is practice is more about repetitive actions. Think about a musician uh, practicing scales, um, things where you're building up that muscle memory. There's that more of that repetition. And experience is when you are putting all these different skills within a complex skill set together at once. So that would be how that musician shows up within a band or how this piece of music, they experience and practice this piece of music versus another piece of music. So those are slow. The fast ways, oh, wait, wait a second. Now in this particular beaker, uh, let me actually go there and there. Um, yeah, what you're seeing on that screen is a beaker where all of the levels all those different layers are equal. Have we ever been on a project <laughs> that was equal like that? Anyone? Yeah, no. Yeah, I think um, Jenny's, I loved Jenny's story where she, um, her story of basically showing up and not recognizing that she couldn't take notes the way she had taken notes all through her schooling. That was a case where her own internal state, the amount of focus and attention just translating, it was taking so much of her attention. So there was less space for those other kinds of kinds of decisions. And as I worked with this model, I got really curious here. And this is actually a beaker that I created. This is where I put my where I put my attention when I'm working as a graphic facilitator. Actually, I think I might just have that. There we go. Let's do get that back over here. So this is kind of all those equal levels. And this is how I, how I characterize where my focus and attention goes. And because of the practice, because of the experience, I'm able to put a lot my focus where I wanted to go. So certain bands like color, I don't have to think about it all. I know exactly how I choose colors. There's no reason to, to approach color a different way than I did on the last 200 projects. Or materials, incredibly comfortable with my materials. Um, certainly distilling, I have a massive amount of distilling experience, so I don't need any attention to, towards that in that moment, which frees me up for a lot more of the synthesis skills. Those things like thinking about the whole composition or that sense of navigation in the drawing. So, because I've practiced, because I have this experience, I'm able to 
focus my attention in the it, where I I get to put. What am I trying to say? <laughs> I I can be mindful and put my attention exactly where I want it to go. There aren't those distractions now. Certainly, if I'm in a room with a lot of auditory noise, that purple band gets wider because I can't filter that out. Right. So that's an example where I might not have a lot of control of where my attention is going because of how this particular human is wired. So those are slow ways. Let's talk about fast ways. First fast way is awareness. And the second fast way is systems. So first is that awareness of all these skills within this skill set. It isn't magic. We know it's really demanding work when we support groups of people live, but we, there, we know what all these different pieces are, right? So first thing is awareness. These are the skills within the skill set. Again, we're going to talk more about those three. And the second part is a systematic way to learn each skill. So, uh, very simply, you know, that example of color, you know, for somebody who doesn't really have any training in color theory or, or any, you don't have to have color theory to be able to get comfortable with color by any means. But it could be that if that feels really unfamiliar to you, it's going to take up a lot of space in your attention. But there's very, this is one of the things I love teaching the most is some technique I'll call the trio. You start with three colors. Every, each of those three colors has a job. You know exactly what it's meant to do, which means now it takes up that much space <laughs> in your attention. So all the times we can be aware of a piece of one skill within the skill set, we can systematically learn it. Um, then the practice is much more efficient. And it takes up far less of our attention. So we can allot that attention to exactly where we want it to go. All right. So again, when you have these, your practice gets far more efficient. And the experience is always, always, always going to take time. And it's what makes you unique and a valued partner. So let's get into the focus on these five skills to be a legendary listener. Now, this is a screenshot from a uh, lesson in Gold Star Graphic Facilitation. This is how I see uh, kind of another iteration years later from the three slices you saw in the wheel. And uh, we're going to focus mostly on the first, the first three of these five. Five components, core components, when you're listening. First is mining. And mining is deciding what is it you want to capture, separating out all the little extra bits and pieces to what is it that should be captured for this particular in this particular group, in this particular conversation to meet this particular objective. Once we know what we want to capture, second core competency is distilling, taking that longer phrase and stating it more succinctly while still being accurate. The third core competency is the, <laughs> thanks for the shout out for my gold nails in the video, not gold today. Uh, third core competency is placing, placement. Where does this idea go on the page? So all of these are um, much more about these intangible decisions we make. And then the, the last two is relating, again, connecting. How do these different ideas fit together? And do I want to visually show the connection, visually show the, re the relationship between different ideas. And then what I call drawing in this model is basically just writing with more choices. We have so many visual choices we can make as we write words, things like how large or small is this? are these words in this chart? Um, is it uppercase or lowercase? Is it a certain color? Is it a certain style? Yeah, exact, thank you. Rachel appreciates that writing, drawing is writing with more choices because we can communicate so much in how we treat the words, how we draw those particular words. So, all right, now anyone who has the printout, you're gonna to turn to pages six to eight. I wanted to really walk us through all these beautiful intangible skills that we're employing when we're doing, when we're listening to a group live. So to that end, I created a little mini meeting on those slides, on those pages. Now, anyone who has that printout, or if you're working with blank paper, what I'm going to do is recite this scenario, sort of our test subject here. And you can see, if you have the pages printed out, 
there's a, a band of blank space underneath these this scenario. So by all means, if you want to basically be capturing what you hear me say out loud, absolutely feel free. But notice as I talk through this scenario, just get a little kind of step outside yourself a little bit and kind of notice the ways you're listening, what you're listening for, especially for folks who have experience. Notice what little switches are being switched because it connects to experience you've already had, already have. Does that make some sense? Does that make enough sense to go for it? Thank you for the the giant thumb there, Brian, with your camera. Awesome. All right. So we're beginning with the facilitator A. Let's begin. We're here to kick off designing our next impact conference. Now, we all know last year was rough. So let's use our time today to get all our concerns out in the open, identify what we need, what we need to design a great event, and talk about how to work best as a team. Ugh. Where do I start? I'm still doing damage control from losing so much money last year. I don't think impact is worth the effort. I don't see it that way, B. Low numbers were awful, but the event is really important to our role in the field. Last year's lousy attendance came from, se from several things converging. First, that huge storm canceled flights and the local folks stayed home. But even before that, our dates were before the national conference where we usually get the word out beforehand. And our opening speaker was not the draw we thought he would be for, for ticket sales. Yeah, to Dee's last point, I did not vet him like I should have. I relied on a colleague's word, not realizing he had given the same keynote at several major events last year. And he also didn't follow through on his contractual agreement to promote the event to his audience. Now, I know I was overloaded at the time, but now I know how important the featured speakers are in getting people into our event. I, I'm, I'm not sure if this is what you're looking for, but I, I was thinking that if, if, if this is about our role in the field, uh, our impact, maybe we should look at it as more than these three days. And you know, not just the people who show up, couldn't we think about how to record and distribute the talks to more people? Does that make sense? I, I don't know, maybe it won't work. I'm seeing two big themes out in the field right now. Short term, we're all struggling. But long term, we are making real change. Our work has grown so much, even in the last 10 years. Last year was a perfect example of, of the former. And F's point about thinking beyond the three days of the conference is the latter. We need to acknowledge the current state of things. But if we don't use this platform to think big, we're really missing the mark. <clears throat> okay, uh, excuse me. Do we even know the mark we're hitting? B is getting flack for losing money, but several of you are saying impact is seen as a promo, a kind of promo or a public relations event. So what is it? Where is the budget coming from exactly? Does impact need to pay for itself or is it an investment in our brand and reputation in the field? The Impact Conference was created to stimulate industry-wide out-of-the-box thinking and foster mission alignment. Sharing best practices from every discipline and culture, we seek true connection and deeper understanding of our communities. And we invite everyone to engage with ideas and activate them in your organization. Well, sure, that was X's thing 20 years ago, but under CEO Y, it became about logistics, not leadership. And now, how does Z see the conference? You know, that's a great question, Jay. I'll meet with Z and ask them before our next planning meeting. How are we even gonna get this, this event planned in time? We're so far behind compared to last year. And when are we breaking for lunch? And what are we having for lunch? And I hope it's not sandwiches again. And did you hear what last year's speaker said online? Okay, okay, wait, can we get back to the timing? I wanna make sure we don't lose Dee's point. We can't control the weather, but let's make sure impact is after the national conference so we can hype it up and hype up our event there. To build on that, let's, let's list other events we can coordinate with. Like many of you have said, we have an opportunity to be big picture thinkers in our space. But given J and H's important questions, we need some answers from people outside the room. For now, let's take a quick break and then keep capturing what worked and what didn't work logistically the last couple years. 
last couple conferences. We'll get back to the bigger themes and purpose in the next meeting. And scene. All right. So I just want to invite you to finish up any notes you might have been taking. How, uh, how familiar did that sound? Has anyone heard some of those, some similar things? I'm seeing some smiles. So that's, I think, smiles of recognition. Excellent. I'm seeing faces, looks like you all are good. <laughs> so next, I just wanna give you some moments to notice and reflect and write down some new observations from Jenny's story, from the speaker analogy, from that conversation, that imaginary meeting, uh, the some, somewhat typical meeting I just uh, walked through. So I'd love for you to make some new observations, uh, that jot down any observations about the skill of listening and certainly any reflections on your own listening skills. So go ahead and just take a few moments to write down your ideas. Can I get a thumbs up if you felt like you got, got some good stuff down? Excellent, got some fast thumbs. Fantastic. Excellent. Now you have an opportunity. We're going to break into breakout groups so you can share. And oh, Brian just got a call. And he's <laughs> he's going to push the magic button for the breakouts. Uh, so um, I'm not sure if he's, are you doing two people or three people? I'm doing two or three people. And so that means uh, you'll have about two minutes per person. Um, and so that's seven minutes total plus an extra minute, six, six minutes total plus a, 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 one extra minute, so seven total. Excellent. So the way we're, we're going to do this is two minutes, and I want you to use your two minutes. So if you share one observation and you have more time to talk, share another one, share something about yourself, hopefully in this realm, <laughs> somewhat on topic. And um, what we're going to do is the person with the next birthday goes first, and then somebody else offers to uh, keep time, those two minutes. A best practice I really like I, whenever I'm a timekeeper in a breakout is I say that when that when your time is up, I'm going to put up my hand because I hate interrupting somebody verbally. It just feels so rude. So I give folks a visual cue. So use that if that's useful. So again, Nancy's ready. She's got her stopwatch. Fantastic. Perfect. So uh, go ahead and in these breakout groups, I just want you to go ahead and share some observations from our session so far. Enjoy meeting in each other. And in seven minutes. Perfect. Thank you. I love seeing all the beautiful humans back in the Zoom room. And uh, how many folks learned something from somebody else's story? Excellent. Fantastic. Different perspective. Fantastic. Wonderful. Welcome back. Uh, if anyone would like to share a tidbit, a nugget, a gem from your conversation in the chat, please feel free. I'm always sensitive. I was just telling Brian, I'm not the best guy. Uh, I have very great spatial awareness and very poor time awareness. So I, I feel like I have to squish more in our final half hour. <laughs> so let's look at these five skill sets in more depth. Casey, did you have a, a comment? Was that what the hand was? Oh, you're muted. I was muted. kind of sneaking it to me. Buttons. There we go. I was trying to sneak it up there. Uh, something you said earlier, and I told inside the group and yeah. made me think about it, was I, my dad's favorite uncle. Um, he's one of those guys, when you spoke to him, in that moment, you were the most important person in the world. You knew it. And you said something about, you know when you're being listened to. And the, just the power inside yep. that. Um, yep. Yeah, I think it's powerful. So thanks. Thanks for helping me remind me of Uncle George. Thank you. That's awesome. Yay, Uncle George. That's fantastic. Thanks, Casey. Any other observation to share in the chat or aloud? Something stood out so far? If not, that's OK, too. <laughs> I like to make space for a little bit more conversation than presentation. I'll maybe add. I was craving um, adding structure to the conversation and also noticing that I tend to, I really have a, like I process information by writing it down. And so just the idea of how like the deaf don't have that, it's a different option, but that's an interesting um, thing I had never thought of before. So it was kind of a cool thing to yeah. hear. Yeah. 
and you know appreciating that because you know that that's a tool that works for you you know like that's one th i think all of this work i just i i very much my mindset is not skill well it is skill based <laughs> But I, I don't believe in the, the magic talent stick. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that there's any one magical process or system. And I think to your to your point, we're all just building up the tools we have at our disposal and better understanding ourselves. And like that, you know that your way of making sense is through that note taking, right? Like, so you yeah. know that's a tool in your toolbox. And you can appreciate in Jenny's story, you're like, well, wait a second. <laughs> yeah, what would and, I do in that situation, right? And like I had the experience of, of being in a foreign country like learning French and being frustrated by that and like knowing the nuances of, like that I was struggling with the language and the other things and also I mean one of the yep. things I like to think about is like the best tools is the one you use and you can just add more tools and use yes. them yes I think um something let me know if uh, anyone kind of raise your hand if this is sounding familiar you discover that new tool you absolutely love and you start using it and you and like as soon as you stop using it you start feeling bad does anyone have tool guilt when they stop using a tool? Yeah. Brian's giving, yeah, I'm seeing a couple hands. Yeah. I, I had uh, that with and, the Noyland twin one, actually. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Physical tool. Excellent. Uh, and my, you know, this one of my mantras is no tool guilt. Like you have these tools in your toolbox and they're there when you need them. Yeah. And also it's like right. adding on that. Sometimes the tool is there for a certain phase and either you might outgrow it or you might just like, just, you don't have to carry all the tools all the time. It's something you can pick up again later and like dabble with, but it is, I exactly. agree with letting, letting things go is also a skill and it's very yeah. powerful, very helpful. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Rachel. Fantastic. Excellent. If there are other comments, please add them to the chat. I like Tony's, Tony's pod breakout said, we all started with, I am not a graphic facilitator. Fantastic. Fantastic. I love Brian's definition of the group. So, excellent. All right, now let's get a little bit more into this nitty gritty of these different skills. Uh, I welcome you to grab um, the uh, pages two, two, three, and four in the PDF. Now we're gonna talk about these five skills within the skill set of listening when we're making listening tangible. And um, let's see, I'm just thinking timing. There's a very good chance if anyone has to hop off in 15 minutes, I respect it. I get it. I would like to go a bit longer. If that's okay with Brian in the Zoom room. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. All right. So let's talk about that first skill set of mining. And um, so again, this is that principle of what is worth capturing. Uh, and I'd like you to, as we're talking about this skill set, I'd love for you to observe for yourself what makes that skill harder for you personally, uh, where you might think um, this, I, I, it's harder for me to mine what is important from what is not important uh, in this particular circumstance. And also notice what are different factors that make this particular skill easier for you. So, um, and I want to invite you to use the plus, uh, the minus and the plus on the sides of the, of the test tubes on that page, just to jot some of those ideas down for yourself. And then there's area, the area underneath is simply to make any other observations you like. So an example here is for me, one of the things that makes mining information, just one of the biggest things is just the basic uh, listening full stop is acoustics. I have one of those brains and bodies and ears that are like completely 100% open all the time. So if I, one of my worst projects in the world was in a commercial kitchen with all the pings and the pangs and the hums and the sound bouncing off, right? So that's an example where that took way too much of my energy, too distracting. But one of the things that makes it really easy for me, and I know a lot of people, every time I mention this, I get nods of recognition in the gallery, is any of us who grew up in dysfunctional families, we probably had to develop some super, I see you, <laughs> to develop some super strong listening skills. So that's one of those things that maybe we didn't want to get that those skills in that particular way, but that is something that actually makes listening really easy for us and makes us the kind of listeners who pick up on all sorts of different signals beyond you know, what is being said out loud. So um, I'm going to skip that timer, keep moving. Uh, well, I'm going to borrow something from the Deep Dive Day Lucid Listening. So if you ever want to learn more about this, this is exactly where to go. 
And in that, I, I tried to make the intangibility of listening physical. And now I'm just walking around the corner here to grab a little prop. <laughs> so in, the, in creating this deep dive course, I actually took all the different parts of language and made them physical. And folks who were joining me live uh, for the archive, what became the archive, they got all these actual physical little bits of language. So part of this workshop, this workshop really focuses on mining, deciding what is important and what's not important, and distilling. And these little symbols represent different parts of language. So uh, on page five, I welcome you to add some notes here. I kind of broke down language conversation presentation very generally into these component parts. The first thing you have are the things you're trying to get out of the way. And this is distractions, obstacles, and confusion. So I'd love for folks to add to the chat in that conversation, in that in our mock uh, conversation, go ahead and add the letter of some uh, somebody saying something that to you felt like it was a distraction, an obstacle, or a con or confusion. You can add their letter, or you can say, describe a particular point, K. Yep. K was the one who wanted lunch, exactly. <laughs> K's wondering when lunch is, and if we're getting sandwiches yet again. For sure. That one definitely comes easily. So where did you see these in the, in the meeting? And uh, number one, so here we've got uh, Kay, and out of this, out of her observation, her, her stream of consciousness, maybe this part is important. You know, so if in this case, if she's kind of riffing and talking, you know, thinking off the top of her head, um, this is a case where if she said, if she's saying, how are we even going to get this planned? And we're so far behind. There's that kind of sense of urgency or anxiety. This is a perfect case where if I was not facing the group, I'd look at the group and see like, is this Kay's observation or are more people agreeing with her, right? So that's a great case of going like, you know, that she's kind of letting out something that feels anxious or urgent, but I'm going to use observing the whole group to kind of see, again, how widespread is that, is that uh, um, uh, concern. So here's a great example of the confusion. So he's here, maybe he's newer to the team, H, and, you know, this is a case where he's, like, okay, guys, I'm hearing different things here. So I need, I'm asking lots of clarifying questions. And definitely we've got B acting like that obstacle. Like he doesn't even know why we need to have this freaking confer conference anymore anyway, right? Now I'm of the opinion when we have <laughs> the big red brick, the bees in the room, that they are very often stating their concerns because they actually care. They're trying to shoot things down to make the thing stronger. Now it may not feel that way, and the people who have to work with B day in and day out probably don't feel that way about him. But especially when I come in, I see Tony smile. You're, you're knowing that kind of if you've, you've been on teams with those kind of folks. I'm guessing you're not you're not a B. Can't imagine Tony's a B. <laughs> that um, uh, when I come in as an outsider, you know, I don't have the same experience with the obstacle type personality, and I'm always listening for. What is, what is the kernel of what they're saying? And very often, instead of stating, I don't think impact is worth the effort in front of everybody, I would flip it into a more generative phrase like, is impact worth the effort? What do we do about um, losses? What do we do about damage control? So those are ways that we're opening up the conversation instead of you know, the brick being dropped in the middle of the conversation. All right, our next set of parts of language is what we want to sort in group. This is what we want to keep, and this is what we want to organize. And that's points, the points people are making. That's a really great point, B. <laughs> that's, I really wish K would get around to, <laughs> around to making a point. Uh, and then around the points are the fuzz. This is the gibble gabble. This is the, hum, um, uh, the hems and haws the wonderful social connections people make in between making points, and the flourishes. Now, sometimes the flourishes are something like a story. Somebody's kind of painting a picture, telling a story, and that leads to their point. Uh, sometimes flourishes are things like 
uh, more obscure language, like the person who thinks they get paid by the word. And so they just, you know, take a long time to get to their, Rachel appreciated that one, thank you. <laughs> right. So um, what were some of the, in that, in that conversation, uh, where did you see some of these points in the meeting? Go ahead and add any observations to the chat. If you got them. Otherwise, you already, already saw the first one I pulled out. And that is F. And she actually has some really great points in this. Gina's nodding loudly. Yeah, she had some great points. And happily, you could see her colleagues heard her point. It wasn't lost, even if she might have been very unsure of herself, using lots of extra words around what she was saying. So out of this, you know, she had this great point about thinking about the conference more broadly. So really strong points with a whole lot of fuzz, whole lot of fuzz. We have to have patience for folks and their fuzz, but we can't hold on to all that. We need to filter that out. Another example here, this is she lost her letter. I think I'm awfully sure this is I. For me, this is, <laughs> I actually grabbed a couple mission statements. A big part of this was um, uh, the TED mission, the TED conference mission, which was exceedingly broad. Um, but this is very much what I consider the flourishes uh, and the less productive flourishes. You know, this is the kind of statement that was created by committee where somebody clicks into, you know, the corporate mottos, the corporate phrases, which don't sound human anymore. You know, when I'm when I'm in an event and somebody says that, I'm like, I'm not making it my job to perfectly quote that thing. Like, let's print it out and put it on the wall. We need that wording, right? Because that wording does not feel human anymore. So, so there's a couple examples of that second, those second categories of parts of language. Our third point is absolutely the stuff that helps us level up, level up the conversation. And yeah, absolutely, Casey says, my job is not to, to capture their non-human discussions. We wanna hear them talk about why that mission is important or why that statement needs to change, right? We all have heard that thing a thousand times. It doesn't really mean anything to us anymore. So let's get to what the human discussions are. So here are these parts of language we want to, uh, that really help elevate the conversation, more of that big picture, that sense of structure or uh, making connections between different ideas or insights. So any observations about where did you see these in the meeting? Anyone notice that sense of structure or connection or insights? The order of events related to promotion. Yep, absolutely. Starting to put those different pieces in a certain sequence. For sure. Now here, you know, the facilitator kicked up, kicked off the session clearly, where she's saying, you know, our objective in this time together is we're kicking off designing the conference. And within this, you know, she acknowledges that last year was hard and then says, you know, here's the three main things we're going to do. We're going to get those concerns out in the open. We're going to identify what we need to design a great event. And we're going to talk about how to work best as a team. So here we have you know, those, those things kicked off at the very beginning. The, um, my insight was how well they worked together and got a lot of the wasted conversation resolved. Excellent, yeah. And here's, you know, I think that might be the specific one Rachel was referencing. You know, here D is bringing up kind of that um, uh, bigger picture summary of what were some of the factors that led to the low numbers. So in this case, yeah, and maintain their humanity. Great point, for sure. So here she's making this great connection of saying, you know, here are the things that came together to make last year's conference difficult. And then she describes describes uh, three of those things. Now here, G, he's kicking it off. He's making it super clear. I'm seeing two big themes. <laughs> we, I love these people in the room. <laughs> these are my favorites, but I also tend to be a synthesizer. But I think, you know, often we kind of identify the G and uh, you know, can love it when they kind of are summarizing or creating that, that uh, making observations about how the pieces fit together. So got those insights, those 
lightning bolts. So I wanted to um, just give you a little time, just a little bit of time to go ahead and jot down what did you notice about mining and add to your speaker specifically around mining. And I do invite you if it, if it feels comfortable to kind of think about how little or how much of your attention is put towards that skill. wrap up your current thought. You can always come back to this later. I appreciate Brian asking, what do you do when someone says, I see two big themes and then only explains the one theme? And Gina said, okay, I got X. And what was your second theme? <laughs> absolutely. I, uh, that is absolutely a, okay, I heard the first theme was this. Did I miss the second one or was the second one, you know, buried in the first one? Yeah, I have no, no problem asking those kind of clarifying questions. Absolutely. Now let's move over to distilling, that next skill set we have. And here, this is, uh, oh, I thought I had my, got my words out of order. That's okay. There we go. Uh, the, the, skill, the skill within this broader skill set of distilling is we know what point we want to grab now. How do we make that point clearly and succinctly? Why do we want to make that point succinct? Please add to the chat why brevity or distilling is important to what we do. Because <laughs> you only have so much paper. That's one of them for sure. To aid recall, less visual noise, so much time to write it. Because flower, flowery language distracts people from, from probably the main point uh, to move to the next thing. Absolutely. Yeah, there's definitely, you're thinking about the real estate on the page. You can fit more information if they're shorter phrases. The How slow it is to remember and write out full sentences. And I think very much to several of these comments, uh, Nancy's point of people can only remember so much. One of the things I like about simplifying language is even if... Um, uh, Brian makes a particular point and I capture that point succinctly, when I simplify it and get to the nugget of Brian's point, certainly Brian feels heard, his point has been captured, and other folks can respond and add to that point. So it isn't Brian specific at that point. Now it's, here's this idea, what do I want to add to it? Make sense? Excellent. So, uh, here, this is a page um, from the Idea Shaper book. I do use the, one of the Idea Shapers, 24 specific tools for visual thinking. Um, one is called the Retort. It is this shape of a, an Alembic, the glassware in a lab. And this is absolutely, we're starting out with a soup of sources, the entire conversation. Casey, I'm glad you like that image. Uh, so we got that soup of sources, the entire presentation, the entire conversation. Our Bunsen burner, that flame that's heating up that soup of sources is our objective. What is it we're trying to get to in this conversation? Or as an individual speaker, what is it you're trying, what message are you trying to share with your audience? And of course, with that heat and that Alembic, with that retort, the most salient points come to the top. And then we have that beautiful, clear, concise chunk of information. And this is a drawing I borrowed from my uh, the core course, the Agribeck method. And three core questions we're asking when we're distilling is, is this, particular chunk useful, again, that we're mining as we we're mining a chunk out of the conversation, is it useful? The next, the way I'm distilling it, is it accurate? Does that person or that group feel that their idea is reflected accurately? And then is it succinct? And there you see that idea of a memory peg. You just need that little, that shorter phrase that's good for that recall. But it's also a, a, that, that, re, 
that phrase is a memory peg in that it helps you remember that idea, but it is can also hold other ideas. So in this case, Dee's talking about, you know, this, all the uh, last year's lousy attendance. And if I look at this, you know, here's, if I was thinking about out of all those great words that very beautifully summed up the low turnout, these are some of those phrases that I'd pull out, you know, from what she said, you know, that could have the last year's attendance, those three main factors, the storm, not having a chance to promote at the national conference, and the speaker not bringing in the folks we thought he would. Another example here is when H is bringing up all these concerns or trying to get, asking all these clarifying questions. You know, the first thing he says is he's, answer, he's asking this very broad question. Then he's referencing what B had said, and he's summarizing what several other people had said, right? So those are things that are probably already, I've already captured very likely. And then he's starting to ask these more specific questions. Where does this budget come from? And I think the core of this particular uh, part of this conversation is, you know, this question of does impact need to pay for itself or is it an investment in our brand and reputation? So are those couple of examples useful to really think about clearly about distilling? Excellent, thank you. And oh, let me back up for a second. This is one of those things that um, one of the advice I often give to folks is if you find that there's certain parts of what of the work you do that aren't coming as fast and as easily as you would like, like a musician practicing scales, focus just on that. We always have the opportunity outside of a professional project, outside of a gig, to sit and listen to content and just focus on distilling. What? <laughs> I think at this point, we're all so used to bringing all these different decisions together right, to think about color, think about scale, all these wonderful choices we have. And if you just zone in on this particular skill and practice that specifically, all of that very specific practice, like practicing scales, is absolutely going to make less space in your brain when you're distilling on the next project. So just a moment to uh, write down any notes for yourself, reflections on this your observations of yourself and your practice around distilling. Next, we're going to move to placing. Where did these ideas go on the page? And here, ooh, we got some balloons there, Rachel. Your Zoom, your Zoom just had a party. Not sure what happened. We just got some <laughs> balloons coming up. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Again, recognizing timing-wise, if folks have to jump off, completely understand. And I love that Robin actually has a balloon next to her. That's fantastic. <laughs> So I uh, absolutely hope some folks can, can continue with me here, but if you need to leave, totally understand. So this third core competency of placing, this is, got these guys out of order, that's okay. This is making the, all these decisions around where does this point go in the drawing? And here, um, off, well, let me back up for a second. Often we think about placement, um, a lot of folks, this is, they don't spend a lot of energy thinking about placement because they're basically treating a big horizontal surface like it's a series of columns. You start in the upper left behind my picture up there and work down till you run out of paper. Then you move over to the right. Work down till you run out of paper. Then move to the right. Work down till you run out of paper. Now that's absolutely capturing, distilling, mining the information, and there's very few spatial choices made in this case. Uh, here's an example where the, it was a series of uh, three minute speeches. Here, they really just needed to be sprinkled like popcorn. That's all we needed to do. That's the, the best decision was to have everyone on the same level, the same kind of treatment. Here's a case where it's working around a center title. And here the placing is we're gonna work across the top, then we're gonna work across the bottom, right? So these are ways where there aren't very sophisticated choices for placement. They're things that absolutely work. This was a keynote speaker. Thankfully, she said I had five, she has five keys and she delivered five keys. 
that same event, there was somebody who had eight somethings, eight pillars, and he only gave us four and then encouraged you to buy his book to learn the other four. Yes, Gina. <laughs> exactly. I literally had half a chart empty. And I was cheekily, I really wanted to write by the book on the second half of the page, but I did not. All right. Here's a case working with Holger Schultz at that same conference as the competency wheel. We had had a conversation about what his process looked like beforehand. So I knew to start with a shape that where he was, as he was talking, we were, I was drawing out his process, but also knowing that one of his points was he would want to complete the process. You'd want to say that this is a repeatable process. So that's a case where we knew some shape going in. Now here we're borrowing some really juicy, yummy, very learnable, very practicable pieces from this second deep dive workshop, which is called visual listening. And this is on page nine, you'll see these nine keys. These are spatial cues that are embedded in language. These are the ways normal humans in conversation talk to each other that help us bridge one point to the next and tell us how these different ideas fit together. Does that make some kind of sense? Excellent. Now, here's an example. We're just going to kind of walk, walk, walk through the um, uh, examples from this conversation. So A saying, let's use our time today too. So it's a big, broad kind of category. When I hear the word too, and understanding somebody's inflection, I always want to put a semicolon, no, a colon after that, <laughs> and knowing that there's probably going to be a list that comes next. So this is a case where uh, she's starting out with um, this kind of title, and then I'm, I sense that there's now going to be a list. So similarity is one of the keys, like sets of information. So these are three things all on the same of the same type. In this particular case, the objectives of this meeting. Our next example here in response to B, C says, I don't see it that way, B. So that's a bridge from his not terribly constructive point <laughs> to what she wanted to share. And this is that key of contrast. You know, I don't see it that way. I disagree. All these ways we're, we're showing that what that building off of that person's point and sharing a counterpoint. Now, when Dee shared this, we have a couple here. Um, you know, here we have that idea of several things converging. And that is the idea of like um, uh, cause and effect, results, consequences. So thinking about what, what were the factors that ended up in this low attendance. And here, uh, this is another case of similarity. So she talks about several things that's queuing me up for a list. And then there was first, it was this before even, but be, even before that cues up that next point and then, and cues up the third point. Also very specifically here, but even before that, we have a key of sequence. We put the cart before the horse. We had our conference before the national conference. So that's one of those sequence cues, sometimes very specifically time-based, sometimes more just before and afters more generally. Now here E is responding to D's last point. Here, this is the spatial cue, the key in language of diving deeper. So he's building off of what D said and now is going into more detail. And he's saying, okay, I totally hear you. Let me expand on what happened with the speaker, the opening speaker. Here G, we already sort of talked about this with those insights. You know, the, the spatial cue is I'm seeing two big themes. And to Brian's point, hopefully he shares two big themes. This is leveling up. So what I'm noticing, what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing is, you know, those are great cues in language that sound like somebody's probably going to be leveling up, making some kind of a, broader observation. Here, when L says, uh, can we get back to timing? That's our next key, switching gears. We hear this all the time, right? I want to go back to this idea. I don't want to lose this point. 
Sometimes it's going back to a point. Sometimes it's just truly switching gears into something new. But often it is that getting back to another point that probably is already on in our drawing. So now how do we want to connect L's point to D's point? And here, her closing before the break is full of keys. Uh, first, we have to build on that. Very simply is building on the idea. Just adding to the idea, not necessarily leveling up or drilling down. It's just here's another factor to consider building on the point. Like many, many of you have said, this is the key of recapping. So like many of you, you have said, that's a cue to me that she's summarizing. It's a cue to me that she's, it probably connects to what has already been captured because it's already been said. Here, we've got this for now. Let's take a quick break. This is a conclusion, just a conclusion of this particular part of the agenda. But think about how often in, well, notice my key is hidden behind me, but it's there. Um, how many times, especially with a single speaker, we can hear that shift in their speaking, the shift in their tone, the shift in the, the pacing of what they're saying right before they say that conclusion, right? There's a different way people speak when they're like, and sometimes they say, you know, in conclusion, that's a really giant <laughs> clear key. And there are definitely all these different ways we signal an end of some sort. And here we've got keep capturing what worked and didn't work. So again, she's leveling up. This is much like she kicked off the event. She's saying, okay, in our next part of the of this session, here's what we're going to focus on. And again, great sequence cues for now then, and we'll get back in the next meeting. So first, I would love any kind of general, oh, we're going this way. Uh, I'd love your, uh, any observations around those kind of spatial cues. Is this something folks have already been kind of tuned into? Or is this kind of a new way of listening, hearing? New to, new to Robin, excellent, excellent. Any observations? Anything you notice there? <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Rachel says, I learned it in a course I took called the Agerbeck method. <laughs> and this is one of people's, the, we very briefly cover these cues in the second module and people love them so much that that's why we had an entire deep dive workshop built off of that. And it was for me getting to nerd out going, okay, I, I got it this far in that one lesson, but now how much farther can we take it? And really it is pretty incredible when you start tuning into this, that there are so many common patterns in language. And, and very much to Brian's point very early on, we we're talking about wiring. I'm somebody who is super duper duper wired into spatial reasoning. Like they pulled me out of class when I was six years old to go take spatial reasoning tests. <laughs> so I can understand for folks who were like, how did you hear that? How does that make sense to you, right? Happens I was wired for it. I make very good use of it. And thanks to that deep dive, I was able to tease it apart and make it learnable. So now that you're aware of this, right? That's that awareness, the fast way to learn. And now you have a more systematic way to approach noticing those spatial cues, you know, that's what makes our practice far more deliberate and helps us use far less, far less of our energy in the moment, thinking about where does this next idea go? Because when you're tuned into these spatial cues, these keys, it's right there. They just told you where it went. Ta-da. It eventually will feel that way. <laughs> May not feel like that, that way at the moment. Well, thank you, Barb. Love how you distill your learning. There you go. Well, Happy to answer questions about the course and the books. Appreciate the shout outs for sure. And just take a few moments to notice some observations around placement. Excellent. I appreciate in the chat uh, the question. I'm wondering how I can practice using the keys being a solo practitioner, inviting myself to my friends' workplaces. Do it. Why not? Right. And happily, we're never, we're never lacking content. Um, I happen to be tuned into this probably because it's Oscar season. I'm a big, a big movie watcher and um, Variety and uh, Vanity Fair. 
there's a couple different um, publications around movies where they do long uh, videos, like the round tables, and they're very conversational. So that's a great example where, you know, you could listen to this longer piece of five directors talking about their movies or five screenwriters, right? Great content because people are bouncing off of, those are truly conversational. They're not like a panel discussion where five people just each say their thing <laughs> and there's no connective tissue. That's a, that would be one of my favorite things to, to practice with. And Rachel says, I think I might practice noticing in podcast, practice noticing in podcasts. Absolutely. And you'll notice a podcast that is more structured is going to work a lot different, much more differently than, you know, the classic, very common podcast of a couple people in a very casual conversation, which might have a lot of fuzz. <laughs> For me, I don't listen to a lot of those particular kind of podcasts where it's kind of, you know, joking back and forth. Uh, so you'll notice different types of content, different pacing. For sure. Excellent. Now, again, I really wanted to focus on those first three core components. Uh, and again, because we're now moving into the more visible visual challenges, I know a lot of folks teach this. I love to teach that part as well. Uh, but again, that fourth uh, skill set, and I hope you'll take some time to kind of notice for yourself, that fourth skill set is relating. How are we visually showing the relationships and the connections between ideas? It could be this group of ideas are color coded because they all go together. It could be I'm drawing a, a direct line between this idea and this idea, or I see some potential here. So maybe I'm going to draw a dotted line to show that maybe there's a connection and we're still figuring that out, right? So we have tons of choices of showing how do different ideas relate to each other. And then finally, again, that idea of drawing, I'll we'll sh very quickly show this one. Uh, da, 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 da. Now, here's an example from leading a half day session with my dear colleague, John Ward. And this was a handout for um, a half day workshop with facilitators about using visual and uh, visual tangible tools. Here with this set of criteria, you can see uh, that there are six criteria. Now we certainly can see that there's six criteria because of those stars working as numbered bullet points, right? And there's different levels of information. And we understand those different levels of information in this drawing because I made consistent choices within each of those levels. So even though all of those containers, those bubbles around the six points are gone, even though the stars are gone, we can at a glance see these phrases set everyone up for success, watch what you reward, etc. We understand that all is the same level of information because when I use when I went beyond writing and used some of those visual choices to draw out those six criteria, they're distinctly different from the other levels and they're all similar to each other. Does that make sense? So lots of extremely concrete things we can learn so clear, and I, this is, I, I nerd out morning, noon, and night, that these are so learnable. And happily, once you start building up, understanding what your choices are, that awareness, and that systematic way to learn them, now they don't take up any space in your brain. You have that, well, thank you, Gina, glad you could be here. Take care. Uh, so, you know, now we have all that wonderful space for, that you can, that fo wonderful focus and attention that you can point in the direction you want to point it, point it in. And that, my friends, is legendary listening. We now added far more tools around this skill set. Hope you'll come back, watch this again, use your PDF, thinking more broadly, thinking broadly about your listening skills, but what are the core components within those listening skills? And then learning all those different nuances and those choices. And yes, as Casey says, be a legend as a listener. Thank you for your thanks, Nancy. I appreciate it. Uh, super quickly, uh, again, I love this part. This is what I'm here to do. That's why I'm so thankful you joined me right now. And as just a really quick context setter for resources, uh, you'll see this on the final page of the PDF. Happily, Rachel mentioned that Rachel mentioned the Agerbeck method. That's the core comprehensive course across all these different categories of choices. You can see where listening, all these different skills fit across the course. That whole middle row is relating, is drawing. So much good stuff in that middle row of the fourth, fifth, and sixth modules. 
visual listening, you got to see great stuff there. If you want even like not even even more. If you want a big pile of very clear examples, an entire day archive of those uh, 10 spatial keys, come on over to visual listening. That's exactly what that uh, that deep dive is. And then lucid listening, like we saw, that's that deep dive in uh, in mining and distilling. So those parts of language. For anyone who wants to be able to be more succinct, uh, 